And, and the way this is going to work is that I, I'm going to go on for quite some time um, <laughs> about, the, about the background of the opera, because I think it's very important to, to, to know that. Um, and then Mona's going to come in, and we're going to dialogue for a bit about the sort of central issues of the opera. And then we're hoping for a really champagne bubbling intervention from the public. Um, because we're doing this, by the way, for the second time today. We've just been to Hay and done this in Hay <laughs> and come post haste here. So, so we're looking forward to your invigorating interventions to uh, so be thinking about that while I'm going on here. Arnold Schoenberg was born in Vienna on September the 13th, 1874. Uh, and he was a suspicious, uh, superstitious man, by the way, um, who died on Friday the 13th and deliberately altered the spelling of Aaron in Moses and Aaron because Moses and Aaron with two A's ends up with 13 letters. <laughs> and um, so he felt that was unlucky. And since he did die on Friday the 13th, he may have been right. He was initially self-taught in music, and he was encouraged to continue his musical studies by Alexander von Zelinsky, his future brother-in-law, who was also a composer, as I expect you know. And after his studies, Arnold began work in a bank. And like many of his generation, when it became clear that his future would be complicated by being Jewish, a religion he had inherited but was not actively practiced in his family, he converted and was baptized as a Protestant in uh, 1898 when he was 24 years old. And in this, he was following a pretty well-established path. Mahler had, in fact, converted to Catholicism the year before. And there was, in general, in the second half of the 19th century, a very considerable degree of assimilation of Jews in both Germany and Austria, especially in the larger cities. For the Austrian Empire, with its astonishing polyglot, strident and combative mixtures of nations and cultures, a sort of pre-European Union, actually, um, the Jews were one of its most loyal supporters and duly recognized as such. The Emperor Franz Joseph was only too glad to have some citizens who, at this stage at least, did not have an alternative geographical nationality to which they might owe allegiance. And when, for example, in 1920, the increasingly nationalistic Czechs attacked the very long established German population in the Czech lands, um, they did not discriminate between Jews and Germans, breaking into and sacking the Deutsche Oper, the German opera house in Prague, and the Jewish town hall in equal measure. Uh, to be attacked is one potent symbol of being an assimilated person, and to fight is another. Schoenberg, like a great many of his Jewish compatriots, was called up and fought in the Austrian army in the First World War. Later in the century, many of the older generation would be marched into concentration camps, holding up their hard-won iron crosses in a vain attempt to demonstrate their past loyalty to the German state. This assimilation was primarily reserved for educated middle-class Jews, and in this period, increasingly, they came under threat from population moves from the East, motivated in part by economic immigration and partly in response to czarist pogroms. There was a huge influx of so-called Ostjuden, Eastern Jews, into Austria. The Jewish population of Vienna rose from 73,000 in 1880 to 175,000 in 1910. And these were not the invisible Jews in their immaculate westernized clothes but highly visible and poor Jews from the shtetls. This influx exposed the psychological split at the heart of assimilation and gave rise to a very special Viennese phenomenon, Jewish anti-Semites, of which Karl Krauss, the editor of the magazine Die Fackel, The Torch, was the most prominent. Uh, the tactic of invisibility was very clearly described by Schoenberg himself in an article written in 1934 after he had reconverted to Judaism, called Jede Junge Jude, Every Young Jew. Marked at school by strange appearance, strange pronunciation, participation in a different religious course, and on average, by better achievement, 
Part of our way was from the beginning characterized as follows. One stood out. This would have been good where it tied to honor, but it was bad when it was a reason to hide oneself. Some means were available against it. An attempt, for example, to eliminate the conspicuous through dress and adjustment of facial expressions, through care and the use of language, through change of religion. An attempt to attain lower grades could hardly have been made. It would be wrong to think of this assimilation as cynical. Schoenberg, Mahler, and Zimlinski were at the heart of German culture in the cultural rather than political sense. Their world was that of Bach, Beethoven, Goethe, Brahms, and so on. There is rather chilling proof of that in one of Schoenberg's more dubious utterings. I believe that my new musical system will guarantee the supremacy of German music for the foreseeable future. The word Vorherrschaft, supremacy, is now forever tainted in every German's mind by its association with Nazism, and it would be unfair to blame Schoenberg for an association which he could not have foreseen. Nonetheless, even without that, it remains a disturbing statement. Clearly, it's meant to suggest that Bach had ensured that supremacy up to now, and so places Schoenberg where I am sure he thought he belonged, right next to Bach. A bold claim. But even more disturbing, why did the issue of supremacy in music at all even occur to him? The answer, I fear, is that he was a, a supremacist in more ways than one. In any case, his patriotic German fervor was not going to get him anywhere, as in the summer of 1921, the event occurred which was his moment on the road to Damascus. <coughs> it had been a year of high activity for Schoenberg, becoming increasingly visible and prominent as a composer, and he had planned to spend a restful summer vacation at Matzee, a charming lakeside resort in the mountains just outside Salzburg geraniums on the balcony and all that kind of thing. The city council, however, had other ideas and made the fatal pronouncement, Juden sind unerwünscht, Jews are not welcome. And the respectable professorial middle class Schoenberg left, deeply humiliated and traumatized, recognizing that he must rebuild his life upon a new premise. He now had to recognize the truth of the disgusting little <coughs> ditty by Georg Ritter von Schoenerer. Was der Jude glaubt, ist einerlei, in der Rasse liegt die Schweinerei. What the Jew believes is all the same. It's in his race that you perceive his stain. Schoenberg must, of course, have known about the writings and campaigning of the Zionist Herzl, who had been himself an ardent advocate of assimilation until his similarly eye-opening experience as a journalist covering the Dreyfus trials in France, which led him to conclude that the Jews would never under any circumstances be safe until they had acquired their own homeland. But Matze was a defining moment for Schoenberg because it affected him personally, rather as Gandhi's moment of sudden awareness of what was going on around him only came when, despite his status as a successful lawyer, he was thrown off a train in South Africa for having the wrong colored skin. Many of the assimilated intelligentsia wilted under the necessity to conceive their status in society anew. Stefan Schweig, for example, brought up under conditions of the utmost luxury in a grand villa right next to the Schönbrunn Palace in Vienna, today the Polish embassy in Vienna, never managed to make this leap. But Schönberg went for it straight away and is as in everything he did, with unremitting zeal. He was now a Jew. He was helped on his way, perhaps, by an even more scandalous discovery. Amongst Schoenberg's many talents, he was a distinguished painter who had exhibited with the Blauer Reiter group and through that became a close friend of Kandinsky. Two years after the Matze incident, Kandinsky invited Schoenberg to come to Weimar to help found an artistic and intellectual center at the Bauhaus. But Schoenberg discovered that there was a strong anti-Jewish element in the direction of the Bauhaus. Remember, this is in pre-Nazi times, so this was voluntary anti-Semitism, right in the heart of one of Germany's most radical artistic institutions. When Schoenberg protested about this to Kandinsky, the latter replied that 
he was sure an exception could be made for Schoenberg, who exploded, today I no longer wish to be an exception. I have no objection at all to being lumped together with all the rest. I now hear that even a Kandinsky sees only evil in the actions of Jews and in their evil actions only the Jewishness. And at this point I give up all hope of reaching any understanding. It was a dream. We are two kinds of people, definitely. This was definitely the end of Schoenberg, the assimilated converso. Hello? <laughs> Problem. Schoenberg had a spiritual and a political way to deal with his renewed Jewish self. And these two paths converge in the opera Moses and Aaron. Initially, he explored the spiritual way in an unfinished oratorio, Jacob's Ladder, the ladder obviously symbolizing the way from earth to heaven or the path by which man can come closer to God. On the ladder, so to speak, are two characters, the one who is chosen and the one who wrestles. Both clearly projected doubles of the composer who saw himself as chosen for a higher mission in music as in life and as one who now had to wrestle with the meaning of a religion he had never practiced. The chosen character looks forward in turn to the character of Max Ahrens in his political propaganda play, The Biblical Way. Max Ahrens being obviously a compound version of Moses and Aaron, i.e. the two characters welded into one. So now, alongside his role as the guarantor of the musical supremacy of German music and his role as an artist, exhibiting alongside Kandinsky and Franz Ma, we now encounter Schoenberg as a playwright and author. The biblical way is an astonishing document, a vast, thick panorama of a play showing all the political, social, economic, and military ramifications of Zionism. Though Schoenberg himself never agreed with the Zionist manifesto, believing that the promised land, i.e. Palestine, was politically out of reach, though he never advanced any practical alternative. His objection may have rather been, as has been <coughs> perceptively and perhaps wickedly observed, that Schoenberg was never a great fan of any performance of which he was not the conductor. <laughs> the central character is a charismatic leader, Max Ahrens, whose mission is to equip the Jews to defend themselves and lead them into freedom. Not quite in the promised land, but a desert somewhere near it. Seemingly, Moses stroke Max Ahrens is also an impassioned advocate of the improving effects of austerity. Act one takes place in a sort of fight club where young Jews come to undergo physical fitness training which shows Schoenberg tapping into a whole raft of contemporary political and social models. Above all, the connection between physically healthy youth, gymnastics, and nationalist aggression. This was not by any means confined to the Nazis. In the Czech lands, the Sokol movement, for whom Janacek wrote that amazing symphonietta as to open one of their rallies, um, was exactly such a combination of physical fitness and nationalist chauvinist politics. To the extent that Sokol gangs were known to roam the streets, beating up people they identified indiscriminately as German or Jewish, much as Hitler's brown shirts attacked communists, Jews, gays, and anyone else they disapproved of. When Schoenberg later drew up a blueprint for a political party he himself wished to found, he was explicitly militant on this subject. If I could create a new party, a new sect, it would have to be national chauvinistic to the highest degree, based on the idea of the chosen people, militant, aggressive, opposed to any pacifism, <coughs> to any internationalism. Quite shocking words, actually. At the end of the first act, there is a grand rally of the athletes to whom Max Ahrens delivers a rousing speech congratulating the participants who have learned to appreciate the value of your physical strength. And you, young people, shall be the pioneers in the new, the new land. You shall lay the foundations upon which the glorious edifice of the state will be erected. The rally and the speech could, of course, equally have featured communists or fascists. It was an iconic propaganda device of the totalitarian regimes of that era. However, the future of this new Jewish state would, in Schoenberg's play, not rely only on the physical prowess of its citizens. 
In Act Two, we learn that their enterprise is backed up by the possession of a secret weapon, one of those wonderful radar gun inventions that appear to have come straight out of Star Trek. God has given into our hands a powerful weapon with which to overpower our enemies, an invention that enables us to aim X-rays at any point around the globe and at any distance, which absorbs the oxygen in the air and suffocates all living creatures. Well, its serious and prophetic implication is that here is a militant new Jewish state armed with the equivalent of a nuclear weapon, a nuclear weapon under the control of an unashamedly supremacist and totalitarian leader. In the play, one of Max Irons' lieutenants defends his authoritarian character, and I'll keep the word for leader, Führer, in German, which is a slightly unfair tactic. Remember that when Schoenberg wrote this, Hitler was still far from political power, but you see the point. A Führer has no use for resistance in his nearest circle. He grasps far-reaching objectives. Only those who perceive his long-range objectives are fit to be in his proximity, and they understand that their resistance would only be obstructive and time-consuming, neither elucidating nor furthering the cause. What such a Führer does is either totally wrong or absolutely right. There is no middle ground here. The formidable energy and authority of Max Ahrens was, of course, yet another version of the redoubtable Arnold, now Arnold the activist, to add to his previous manifestations of composer, painter, and playwright. And it is true that one of the reasons that the opera Mosin-Iron was never completed was that from the beginning of the 1930s, Schoenberg threw himself into political activity in a desperate attempt to alert the Jews to the impending disaster, proposing ever more outlandish schemes to rescue them from it. He drafted manifestos for as yet non-existent political parties. He lobbied the US government. And the fact is that in contrast to our, for example, lazy appeasement of the era, Schoenberg was right. He saw exactly what was coming and did everything in his power to rescue the Jews from its consequences. <laughs> Having got the blatantly political, propagandist reaction to his rediscovery of Judaism and its current state of dire peril out of the way with the completion of the play, for which no effort was spared, he even created detailed set designs and scale drawings, Schoenberg turned to the operatic version which would concentrate almost exclusively on his spiritual and theological reaction to the rediscovery of his heritage. The first step in the process was to separate out again Moses and his half-brother Aaron, the idealist on the one hand and the propagandist on the other. Schoenberg, for the opera, largely abandons politics and returns to the Bible, creating a drama out of an essentially very simple dilemma. How is it possible effectively to communicate to a people reared on the representation of many gods that God is now not only one indivisible being, but that he is eternal, invisible, unimaginable, an abstract being of whom one may not make an image? The issue of the use of an image to make an abstract notion of deity comprehensible to the people is the central problem of the work and is shot through with ambiguity. Moses' initial encounter with God is through the burning bush, itself an image, through which God gains Moses' attention in order to command him to teach the people of the nature of the one true God. And Moses protests that he lacks the ability to communicate this idea <coughs> and is promised Aaron, his half-brother, as the mouthpiece. This division of talents is reflected in the music. Moses speaks in a notated form of epic speech whereas Aaron is given the full communicative and seductive apparatus of music to work with. He sings. <coughs> when the people reveal themselves to be skeptical and nervous of the new god, Aaron convinces them with miracles, the snake turning into Moses' staff, the water of the Nile into blood, the leprous hand is healed. But in these powerful and charismatic performances by Aaron, the problem is established. Each of these brilliant shows rouses the audience but distorts the essential purity of the idea. Nonetheless, at this stage, the concept of the promised land flowing with milk and honey, itself an image, is enough to convince the Jewish people to take the risk of breaking out of their Egyptian prison. In Act Two, the people, having left on a high of revolutionary enthusiasm, now find themselves marooned in the desert. Moses has disappeared up Mount Sinai to converse with God, 
for 40 days, and the people become increasingly desperate. Seeing no other way to hold them together, Aaron hold, allows the construction of an idol, the golden calf, and this is accompanied by an explosion of carnal freedom in an anarchic orgy. Moses returns from the mountain and with one imperious word destroys the idol. He accuses Aaron of betraying the purity of the concept of the one all-knowing invisible God, but Aaron defends himself on the grounds of pragmatic necessity. When he rounds on Moses and points out that even the tablets of stone are an image, Moses destroys them, thus unavoidably creating another image. <coughs> At this low point in Moses' story, the act ends with Moses' famous despairing utterance, O word, O word that I lack, and at this point Schoenberg likewise stopped composing. The result of this is that we are left with an image of Moses which is familiar to us from literature, the agonized, inadequate ruler daunted by the impossibility of his task. Heavy is the hand, etc., etc. It's an image that has been constantly evoked to give a ruler a tragic and therefore sympathetic dimension, and so it functions in this case. However, that's not actually what Schoenberg originally intended. This was the low point, but a low point from which the third act was meant to show Moses restoring his authority in a somewhat brutal manner. At the start of the third act, Moses is significantly surrounded by soldiers, not, as before, the people. In front of these soldiers, he conducts a kind of ideological show trial of Aaron, <coughs> at the end of which the soldiers ask, shall we kill him? Moses, to my mind, rather duplicitously, does not answer this directly, but with an experienced politician's cunning at deflecting responsibility onto someone else, he says, release him, and if he can, let him live, upon which Aaron, having been released, falls dead. <laughs> Had Aaron, in the conventional operatic manner, been granted a dying aria in the grand tenor tradition, he could, of course, have pointed out that this miraculous death was just another image but it's Moses who has the last word, and it's a chilling one. The people will now learn purity in the desert. In other words, there will be no promised land. The promised land was also an image. Moses is taking them on a journey of extreme asceticism. Of course, we can never know if Schoenberg would have changed this hard line end if he had actually composed it. But he never repudiated this text, and indeed explicitly indicated that the third act could be read as a spoken conclusion to the evening. This hard line, Moses, is the Moses of Schoenberg's play, the biblical way, and of Schoenberg's own political views. And in this unendingly complex set of issues, it's fascinating to see how the barometer of our sympathy swings to and fro. We are disturbed to see Schoenberg adopting elements of the language of fascism and giving his imaginary Jewish movement many of the trappings associated with totalitarian regimes. On the other hand, it's impossible not to acknowledge that his direst prophecies were entirely accurate, and many Jews have subsequently lamented their inability to defend themselves. In the opera, we experience Moses as a troubled, burdened leader, tormented by doubt and overwhelmed by his task. But in the light of current events, we experience him as a dogmatic fundamentalist, somebody who, to my personal worldview, presents a wholly inimical threat to the individual liberty enshrined in our most precious heritage of the rational, liberal European Enlightenment. I, personally, wish to fight against Moses with every ounce of my intellectual, political, and spiritual being, such as it is. And, of course, most troublingly of all, we experience the advocacy of a march to the <coughs> promised land as on the one hand the result of the catastrophe of European history in the 20th century, and on the other as a continuing source of violence and discord in the 21st. All of these political and social issues should, however, not overshadow the fact that the opera is, in its essence, a philosophical work, concentrating with great musical and textual profundity on the fundamental issue of the communication of the nature of the divine, this core subject is present in two ways. One is the ultimately unresolved debate between the purity of Moses' thought and the impurity of Aaron's communication. And the other is the vehicle, the abstract purity of Schoenberg's new musical system. 
Moses is trying to convey the existence of an unimaginable God, and Schoenberg is trying to convey the nature of a, to many of us, unimaginable abstract musical system. Un no, whoops, turn two pages. <laughs> um, the unpredictable, unknowable, or unimaginable in music, <coughs> as in religion, is hard for all of us to deal with though unknowability probably lies at the heart of religion, just as it remains true that music is an abstract language which actually has no meaning other than musical. Moses and Schoenberg both want to lead us into the desert. Maybe our ears and our souls would be purified there. The question is, do we want to follow it? Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, every time I hear you, this is the second time I've heard you read some of that, and I keep thinking, I'm trying to see that opera now in a completely different way, which is, what exactly was Schoenberg himself projecting on Moses? His political angst, his religious angst, and even from earlier this, this morning when we were at the Hay, I'm thinking, is it really about the the impossibility of communicating the divine, or is this opera really about more of a retaliation? But we'll come on to that. I want to ask you first of all about opera itself, and especially this one, in the sense that many critics have said that art is too remote to connect with the masses. An opera which uses words, language, action, and music, all the senses, all the forms of expression, how does that, how is that used by Schoenberg to, con to communicate what you're saying is the essential philosophical question, that of unknowability of the divine? When you're using all your tools at hand to communicate the divine and then leaving the audience with saying, but we can't communicate the divine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Schoenberg is trapped in the same paradox that, that, that Moses is trapped in. I mean, he's creating in this opera uh, an image, and, and what's more, because he's using text, um, he's even making that, that image more explicit, actually. Um, and, you know, it's not, that, it's not that he wouldn't have had another option. And this is something which, I, I'm not enough of a Schoenberg scholar to know, but it's not something that, that I'm aware really has been ever very deeply discussed. But clearly Schoenberg was, was preoccupied even from before his conversion, or reconversion, with spiritual issues. He, he was a man who definitely believed that to be an important part of his life. And I think, I'm, this is complete speculation now, but I think that he would have understood the, oh my goodness, I, I think that he would have understood the, the mystical message of mathematics, um, which is essentially what music is. Music is, is mathematics given a heart, if you like, given a voice, given a mystical uh, content. And, and, and he would have seen the essential message of music as as being something spiritual. And if I think about the nature of music, um, you know, I think of music as something that sort of sits between, somewhere here between me and Mona, is, is the reality which music describes, which has nothing to do with either of our bodies or our clothes or our, the solid things, sort of the attributes of our material existence but it's something to do with another world that we imagine that is somewhere indefinable but lying between us. And I think that's why we often feel that music is saying something that we can't define, but is something that is very important to us. So the, the interesting thing is that, that you know, this, this supremely intellectual musician with his new theory of music could have had the choice of writing a symphony 
uh, or any piece of pure music about which, which in fact could have expressed the unknowability of the divine because in a way that's what music is there to do and nobody would have questioned or raised any of these biographical or political or social issues that, that we're obliged to raise because he put text down and he created characters and he, and he put something in a historical context which still has huge ongoing political repercussions for all of us today. You know, the reason why it takes us twice as long to get through an airport but you know, is to do with this, this matter. Isn't that the point, though, that he, it seems to me, and I'm even less of a Schoenberg expert than you are, but it seems to me that what he's doing here is not just saying that um, there is a nobility. It doesn't matter that Moses didn't want the blessing of prophecy. Moses wrestled with how does one convey that which can't be communicated. It seems to me that what Schoenberg is doing by putting not just simple text, but very loaded text, very politically charged text, is to actually retaliate against what he himself suffered. And he's projecting himself on Moses, that Moses too would be suffering character. Not because he couldn't know God, because in effect, Moses spoke to God. He was very close to God in some way. But what Moses was rejecting, and what I think Schoenberg is rejecting, is I don't know how to deal with this message. And so his Judaism, it seems to me, his Judaism is not a Judaism that he wants to re return to because he wants to return to being Jewish. He's returned to Judaism because of what he experienced in being rejected as a Jew. And this is a kind of retaliation that I see in him. So Moses then becomes this very complicated character, which I think Schoenberg himself was. Well, I think I, think I may be guilty of leading you to think that. Um, because I, I'm obviously very aware myself and I'm fascinated by the background and the social and political background and I've spent a lot of time elucidating that. I think that somebody who took a slightly different view of Schoenberg than I do would probably at this stage want to say, no, Mona, actually that's not right. Mm -hmm. This man actually had a profound, he was very, very political. And, and when you read this play, you know, God forbid that you should sit down and <laughs> try to read it. It's quite a bad play. But, 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 but I mean, it's incredibly political and, and in a, to an astonishing detail. Okay. But this other person who would appreciate Schoenberg from a different point of view, would I think emphasize that he had a lifelong preoccupation with the, the nature of the spiritual and that he struggled with that. Even... Uh, actually, somebody somebody said a, a, an interesting thing, which is that um, because he was not brought up practicing Judaism, actually Schoenberg already as a teenager or something began to explore spirituality in Christian terms because he was looking for some way to express something that he sensed was a profound part of his being. And I think it would be too cynical of me, and you shouldn't believe me if I've led you to think that, that, that really his, his only purpose was political. Of course, this political event in his life changed his whole life and exercised a gigantic influence over everything that he did after that. But there is a core, there is a spiritual core to this, and I think that Moses and Aaron, as an opera, would not be as impressive as it is if it was, in fact, purely a political revenge but do work. You, but do you see in the opera performance, do you see Schoenberg's own inner political angst coming out? Or do you just see Moses wrestling with how does one communicate? Because Moses does not want to have this prophetic role. He doesn't want it because he can't convey God to his people. And so that's why we have Aaron, who is doing a lot of his talking for him. And yet, and I would also say in comparison within the Abrahamic tradition, Judaism is probably the most prophetic-centered religion. Prophecy really matters. Then you have a slight, a less of a prophetic in, um, aspect in Christianity because we have the incarnation. Then you go back to prophecy in Islam. But I would say it goes back to Judaism with the line of prophecy 
and the prophets mentioned in the Old Testament who reappear in the Quran as well. So in a sense, there is a real paradox here that he's chosen the prophets, not of his own faith, but also the prophets who speaks to God to convey, an op to convey in this offer that you can't talk of God. And yet that is the prophetic destiny. You have to talk of, you, you have no choice once you've been selected or elected as a prophet. Well, that, that's true, but then e even Christ said, um, let this cup pass from me, didn't he? I mean, even he expressed a kind of burden. It is a burden, but it's a burden that has to be spoken of. And I, I mean, I wonder, you see, to, to, to my mind, the, the, you know, the issue of, well, well there's, an, there's another interesting uh, aspect of the, the division, if you like, between the, the pure idealistic thinker Moses and what we would today describe as the spin doctor. Aaron is the spin doctor, isn't he? What was that frightful man who worked for Tony Blair called? Uh, Campbell, that's right. <laughs> yeah, Th that, that's his role. Um, and um, actually, of course, that also has a, a, a very profound period resonance because this was the period in which you know, the spin doctor, the ultimate spin doctor, Goebbels, first of all came, to, came to, to public life. And so that whole aspect of demagoguery, of, of actually how you, how you win over the masses to a certain point of view was a critical theme of, of the 1930s. So uh, to my mind, the, this debate about about the purity of a vision of God, a, a genuinely spiritual vision of God, and its opposite in somebody who's trying to spin the idea of God, lasts until the end of the second act, which is where Schoenberg gave up. And I think that the third, the, the nature of the third act, and especially the, the, the killing of Aaron, to me becomes a, a political pendant to the whole thing. And, and maybe that's why he never wrote it. Maybe he realized this was, this was, this was not part of the spiritual debate that, that he but, wanted to have. But maybe Schoenberg didn't complete the opera because he realized he couldn't answer the philosophical question he posed himself. I think that's right, yes. Yes, if you write an opera about non-communication, ultimately you realize that you should stop communicating. So you better stop writing the opera. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, there are that's some logical. Really, absolutely. And there are some real, really interesting conversations, and I have the translation, are on saying, I had to give them an image to look at when he asks him about what have you done with the golden calf, and you've given them images, and this is spirituality, and true relationship with the divine is not about image. But Aaron is also pointing to a very basic human need. We need an image of sort. We need to be able to imagine God in order to love God. But how do you cope in Islam, for example, with the prohibition of imagery? You have the same... No, but imagery, I think imagery doesn't mean necessarily that you create a physical image. But you have to sense God. And also he talks, or he says in, in, in the translation that I have, Nobody can believe in something they can't feel. So by not communicating doesn't mean that we don't have some sense of the divine within us. And to have a sense of the divine means that even if we don't have a physical image of God, we have some sense, whether it's expressed in words or whether somebody says, well, how do you envisage God? I envisage God as a presence, but it's still... It is still can't make a graven, graven image, image, aren't they? Mm. And all the rest of them are basically instructions about your daily life. Yes. Don't do bad things, don't run off with your neighbor's wife and all the rest of it. So really the amount of information about who God is and how you should think of him are quite limited. Absolutely. Because I don't think that is the issue here. I think the issue is Moses... It's a, it's a side issue, but I think the real issue is his struggle. I don't want this prophetic election. I don't want to do your work. Because your work means that I have to think of you 
in real ways, and I can't think of you in real ways because you really are unknowable, and that's the paradox of all monotheistic traditions. God is unknowable, but he can be known. How can he be known? Well, he, this is, I haven't answered that. I'm not, you know, I'm not that erudite yet. But I think that is the, that is the, that's the real crux. That, and when you look at some of the traditions, I mean, in Christianity, there's a different aspect because you have the incarnation, the God himself. So the religion is not pointing to a prophetic experience. <coughs> God himself has descended on earth. And, and we've allowed ourselves to manufacture a whole repertoire of plastic saints of one sort and another. Well, so that, you know, that, there is a lot of kind of but imagery the, but washing the central, around. But the, yes, but so it's very image focused. But you haven't done that in Islam, have you? I mean, there is no, am I right? There's, there's no, apart from all that exquisite calligraphy and... and, and it's not a God the, image. There's no God image. religion, no, absolutely. But, that's but, but how that do you cope images. with that? I mean, how do your people cope with that? My people? You're well. making me sound like Moses. <laughs> I'm not leading them anywhere. Miriam, anyway. Yes. So. Uh, no, not at all. No, I think, no, because you don't grow up thinking about God in a physical image, but you sense God. But aren't we saying that, I mean, isn't Aaron saying and aren't you saying actually that human beings need an image? I think, yeah, and I think they do. But and I the think whole of Islam survives without an image. No, but I think one of, the, one of the issues is people still need to feel a connection, sometimes through a medium. And although Islam says very clearly, and Muslims boast quite often that we don't need an image, it's just, you know, prayer is here and I can pray straight to God. There's a culture of worshipping at saints' tombs, and not to the saints, but praying at saints' tombs. There's always a desire to have a connection that is here and now even though you may not want to create an image of God, because that is not permitted, but something that might connect you. Because sometimes we, on our own, feel too desolate. We feel we're not capable of doing this. We need an intermediary. That I don't think has translated necessarily into creating images. But I think the paradox is God wants to be known. So he remains unknowable, but he wants to be known. And the, the famous Islamic tradition which says, God created humankind because he wanted to be known. Um, he wanted to be worshipped, he wanted creation to worship him, has stayed a central part of Islamic thinking. Why does God, in his omnipresent being, need to be known? Why does he need that? Okay, some may argue he doesn't need that, but he wants that. Why does God want that? And how do we know that he wants it? I'm asking you that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking because I don't see that that is a central question in Moses and Aaron. I think a lot of Moses and Aaron, from my limited understanding of it, is Schoenberg projecting all his own angst on Moses, his own political, his own religious, his own feelings of rejection on Moses. Well, I think that's also true because, because Schoenberg is himself a prophet, isn't he? I mean, he is, he is a prophet of a new musical language. He feels compel he feels chosen I mean, he talks about the chosen people because he feels himself to be chosen to have this destiny to, to bring about a new musical uh, way of writing down notes and, and, and this is a tough destiny uh, it, doesn't, you know, it doesn't bring him any money, it doesn't, doesn't give him an easy life, he struggles the whole of his life actually um, in terms of economics and all of that stuff um, and, and, you know, finds the whole of his, the Europe is kind of trashed by a, um, by a bunch of thugs who drive him out of his country. So he, he doesn't have a comfortable life, uh, you know. So it, you can see the points of sympathy are, are enormous between, and the identification yes. are enormous between, between him and Moses, and that, that's very clear. Maybe at this point it might be an idea to open yes. this out to any Q&A from the audience. If there's any question... No, I don't think he did. And you know, um, I'm not sure that he was a great modifier, Schoenberg. You know, he, he took a long while to get it to a certain point, and that was it. Um, well, you know, first of all, he was, you know, going through that tortuous process of exile for uh, a while. And as I said in my, my thing, he was incredibly preoccupied 
with all this political activity to try and get everybody in Europe to recognize what was about to happen. I mean, you know, he kind of had a whole scheme of raising money so that actually, basically he had a scheme to buy the Jews out of Germany. He wanted to kind of fund their, fund their immigration so that they would be saved. Uh, and that's really what preoccupied him for, I think, seven years, I mean, from 33 to 40. Um, you know, and then he was trying to make life in America, which was not easy. Uh, uh, you know, and it was only really after the war um, that he began to get one or two of academic posts and, and, you know, the sort of sources of income that made life a bit easier. And he always maintained, and he constantly maintained in his letters, I'm about to get down to finishing the third act of Moses and Aaron. And, you know, it's actually very short, the third act. It wouldn't have, you know, wouldn't necessarily have taken him very long. But, I mean, I, I think you're right. You, you said, you know, fundamentally, this is an unfinishable subject. It cannot have an end. It would be embarrassing almost if it had an end. I think it would be embarrassing if it had the end that Schoenberg wrote for it. And what is it one great passage of the piece that has any ending? It's remarkable to us our lives how we don't deal well with endings. He starts from a retreat, from an journey. The passage of the piece is the time of Sunday day one sees it. We don't like endings. And one Certainly not the end thing, and I think more of those followers when we cannot enter are different kinds of disappointment and even um, there's another possibility too, which is quite interesting, which is that you know before Schoenberg got round to this whole twelve turn thing, he, I mean he wrote a lot of exquisitely lush, beautiful, late romantic music. So he knew how to do that. You listen to Guralida, or the Song of the Wood Dove from Guralida. This is beautiful music in, in the sort of late Wagnerian tradition. And so Aaron, in a way, represents the continuing of that lyrical, heart-reaching music, of which Schoenberg was suspicious as an intellectual, as an over-intellectual. He said once, great art has to be created cold. This is a very frightening statement, actually. But I mean, he, you know, he means you have to keep your brain engaged and you can't get being, get being indulgent. But Aaron, of course, is given the, given the role of being indulgent in this piece. And so actually to kill Aaron at the end of the third act would be to kill the memory, if you like, that Schoenberg still <coughs> had of beauty in music. And, you know, maybe that was also a problem for him. Emotional control in the creation of great art. Yes. And maybe he was finding that he was getting emotionally uncontrollable towards the end. Maybe, maybe. Any other questions?
gosh. Um, no, it's, I, I mean, actually, there are Schoenberg pieces. Um, there are settings of Psalms. There are settings of uh, Jewish prayers, um, where I think he is uh, showing an understanding of exactly what you you've described. I would have, I would struggle to find that in Moses and Aaron as such, within the music of that piece. But um, it's certainly something. The, this heritage that you're talking about, of incantatory expression of of, of a religious idea. Um, which is also the same in, 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 in Christianity as well, of course. Um, that's certainly something that Schoenberg understood and, and tapped into as in part of this process. I'm just not quite sure that I would know where to find it in Moses and Aaron. Any other questions? <clears throat> Well, he, he, he had a political mission that he wanted to fulfill. He had an, a, a spiritual quest which he needed to fulfill. And I think, as Mona has said, I think he got to a point where he realized that he couldn't go on marrying these two things up in, in the third act of this opera. And that, that and all the, you know, all the practical things that got, then got in the way. Um, and, you know, the, the other thing is that when he, when he emerged out of all this mess, you know, at the end of the Second World War, I mean, the world was such an incredibly different place to those people. Everything they'd known was in ruins. I mean, you know, that entire culture, the man who talked about the supremacy of German music, you know, whole of German culture lying completely wasted, um, that, you know, must have been very difficult to pick up your pen and think, I know what I'm going to, I'm going to say now, and that's why I think it's one of the reasons we have this huge gulf of, 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 you know, modernist music, which, by and large, you know, has gone past people's uh, ability to understand it in, in, in a kind of intellectual void, because it was just so difficult to, 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 to believe in anything after that catastrophe. I think art always wants to break out, but at the same time, as you said, persuade. And I think that's where the tension lies. How do you break out and say something different, but at the same time say something that appeals to the masses to persuade them? Um, I think artists, artists that are trying in the Islamic world to to say something that is on the edge, that is against traditional ways of expressing ideas about God. Um, I don't know personally of any artists, but in terms of what I read and hear, some of them do find it difficult, but a lot of them don't. A lot of them do find that there is enough depth in whatever art form they're using for them to be able to talk of God. But in some ways, you know, what. What this opera is about is not something new. I mean, this is the history of how does one, how does God communicate? This is the story of all religious traditions, at least the Abrahamic ones. Um, and the tension always is, I think, that 
we cannot, if God has revealed himself, God has emerged out of his infinity to speak to Moses, to give him these images, these signs. Let's stick to this particular author. But it could happen in any religious tradition. So when God reveals, what do we human beings do? We have to respond somehow. We cannot be just silent. And I think the current emphasis, going back to Desert Fathers and the land and the ascetic quest and losing yourself in silence, is actually going against traditional ways of thinking about God, which is if God reveals, we have to speak about him. We can't speak to him, that might be prayer, but we can write about him. Um, and I would argue that even scripture, whether it's a Torah, whether it's the New Testament, whether it's the Quran, is only a book until we give it expression. So our own expression is going to be as varied as the number of people giving it expression. But I don't think we can keep quiet. I don't think that's the reason why God reveals for us to be silent. Um, This is much better. <laughs> so much better. <laughs> this idea of um, how, how does God reveal himself? Well, you, you, you probably might know a Christian idea of the, 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 the nature of God is love. And it's impossible to love in abstract. Mm -hmm. Therefore, one needs an object I have a quote here from, from another Austrian, Rilke. And Rilke said, when I say God, it is a great conviction in me, not something I have learned. The whole of creation says this word without deliberation, though often out of deep thoughtfulness. And it, it makes me think that actually, it's, is it possible to be human and not think of God, if only to reject him? Um, and I don't mean here, I mean everywhere, all of us. Um, and in some ways, whether it's a Christian God or a Muslim God or a Jewish God, not that I like using those terms, um, whatever our struggle with God, God remains the deepest presence in our lives. So we may end up having an internal struggle with God but I find that once you are a believer of some sort, or once you've been raised in some faith, it's very difficult to completely reject that presence. Um, whether it's a relationship of love, or whether it's a relationship of knowing, it's very difficult to reject it. But uh, on that point about um, the Christian, I remember um, a Christian colleague of mine said, it seems to me that the Christian God is a God who loves irrespective of his creation. And the Muslim God may be a God who needs to be loved. I mean, it sounds very simple, but it's actually quite profound. And it did get me thinking, is this how Muslims talk of the God, that human worship is about access to God, and Christians talk of God, that God loves notwithstanding what his creation does. So the stories we tell of our God, if I can put it that way, actually are quite important. So uh, what you're saying to me, though I'm slightly playing the skeptic here, is that- You're not a skeptic. Is that you're, <laughs> you, the, I mean, your God is quite narcissistic then, if he basically wants he to be worshiped. He certainly not my God, but. Um, <laughs> I think, yes, I think there must be an error, but narcissistic is a really bad word. It's what, we, it's what we give to artists. Um, it's, uh, it's not really. Touche. Excluding, <laughs> excluding present company. Um, no, I think, I, think, I think it's a real struggle because 
I think that if that was true, we wouldn't have this f over flourishing of mystical poetry, which was about our deepest desire and our deepest loneliness is, comes from the fact that we cannot know God fully, we cannot be with God. And that rupture that we had at the beginning of time is the reason why we are so restless. Now, of course, if you don't believe in God, you don't believe in any of that. But I think that if you, you know, C.S. Lewis said the reason he converted to Christianity was because he found the language of atheism really quite boring. Um, and it was because there is a whole vocabulary that is so enriching for the human soul. That doesn't mean that you have to follow in particular ways, but I think that search for something beyond us, whether you call it God or something else, is relentless. And I think we feel it the older we get. Most of us feel it the older we get. Any other comments? I thought one interesting um, other aspect of we talked a little bit about about how how Schoenberg you could you know could have could have kept his notion of spiritual purity and written a symphony or written some kind of piece of pure music uh, that that could have expressed that um, and it's actually very ironic that the longest bit of pure music in Moses and Aaron is of course devoted to the worship of the golden calf, which is the sort of the most diabolic part of the whole proceedings. And you may remember that, that, that um, Thomas Mann, who was a neighbor of Schoenberg's in, in Los Angeles, and when he was writing Dr. Faustus, which is, which is a book, um, a, a very, very wide ranging book actually, um, which discusses um, an artist, a composer, who has a, a composer's block. And through the stain, I suppose you would say, on his soul, that he acquired through visiting a prostitute um, years and years ago as a young boy, as an adolescent, um, there is some kind of flaw in his in his physical being, and through this flaw, the devil comes to visit him. Um, the devil is one day sitting in the corner of his study and says, you, you have a problem, don't you? you? You don't know what to write anymore. You can't, you're a brilliant composer, but you can't get any further. And, and essentially, um, the devil then really gives Faust, in this version, um, the 12 tone system. Uh, I'm simplifying now quite a bit. Um, so poor old Schoenberg found that his neighbor, Thomas Mann, had written this huge novel um, in, which, um, in, yeah, in which the future of music is discussed and, and, and had actually branded Schoenberg's solution as being the product of the devil. And uh, so Schoenberg was predictably very upset about actually, and there was quite a dispute between the two men as, as a result of it. I, mean, I don't think he'd ever actually got to a lawsuit, but, you know, it was sort of, I think he felt that he'd been, he'd been attacked. And the other interesting thing about that is that, because um, all of this sort of ties together somewhere, what Thomas Mann was also sort of exploring in this relationship between art and the devil um, was the sort of medieval barbarity of provincial Germany. And he was seeing that as kind of the cradle from which this whole Nazi nightmare came from. Um, and, and so, you know, he's exploring the work of the devil, if you like, in a, in a number of different ways in, in this book. Uh, you may remember that, that um, Visconti, wasn't it? Was it Visconti or Zeffirelli? I can't remember. Visconti actually made out that this was Mahler. It wasn't Mahler, it was Schoenberg. But Mahler's music sounds nicer, so it <laughs> made a nicer backdrop to that film. Um, but um, 
so, you know, uh, on the one hand, here's Schoenberg striving to come to terms with a, a religious idea, I mean, a, an idea of God, and along comes another artist and describes it actually as a gift of the devil. Um, and, you know, this is quite heavy stuff, isn't Absolutely. it, really? Well, you mentioned the carved scenes, and one of the best lines, in translation at least, is, lust takes us to the edge of life and death. Is that true? You expect me to know the yes, answer? Yes, I that? do. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say that opera is a really good way of depicting that? Well, uh, actually, I mean, yes, I think so. I mean, I think those those are those are journeys that nobody wants to make all the time, but probably to everybody the edge of everybody should have made at some point in their life. I mean, yes, to the edge. And how do you know when you're at the edge? Uh, well. You know if you've fallen off, um, <laughs> which of course happens. Um, but you see, I—I uh, I mean, in a way, what you're—I mean, I when I did a production of Moses and Aaron, um, because I don't really agree with Moses, um, I—I I sort of, and partly because the general, you know, I'm a sort of old hippie generation, really. Um, so I interpreted the the the. the scene of the golden calf was rather like a kind of woodstock <laughs> so it wasn't necessarily and i mean you know you can acknowledge that in moments of anarchy or in moments of physical release or whatever people can go near to the edge and some people do fall over and there are drugs and all kinds of things which either on the one hand liberate your sensibilities and on the other hand can cause tremendous damage to to vulnerable people so you know there are Obviously, there are huge dangers and, and, and maybe some benefits in, in all of those things. But um, I do remember my, my favorite moment in this, in this was that there was this arrival of some tribal elders in the middle of all this. And so they all came in this yellow bus, a bit like you know, Sergeant Pepper or something. And all these sort of bearded and long-haired and weird characters came out of this yellow bus, kind of <laughs> all a bit phased out. And it, well, so to me, the, the scene of the golden calf was at least partly a rather joyous experience. And, you know, then along comes this spoil sport Moses and says, away with this, and the whole thing sort of collapses. And it goes back to a, a, a much more regimented world at the end of, you know. But spirituality. Well, I'm not suggesting that that no, was very spiritual. No, but what I'm saying is a regimented spiritual. world. I mean, religion is about discipline. In the end, it can't just be about love in the abstract. You have to have discipline. You have to have borders and parameters. Yeah, I mean, all of life is like that, too. Yes, but what it? you're saying is that along come Moses, a spoil sport. But I would imagine that this wasn't just joyous, the calf scene. This was really going against everything that the god of any religion said is right. It wasn't just about the graven image. It was what they're doing around the graven image as well. That's right. Well, you know, you think of that word um, ecstasy, which uh, means, if I think I'm right, out of the normal, doesn't it? Ecstasis, so out of the commonplace. Sure. Um, and so, you know, people do get to a state of divine ecstasy and can, you know, I always remember visiting in, uh, in Petra um, in Jordan, you know, when you can climb up and up and up and up and up and you get to one of those amazing bits where those people had sawn off the top of a mountain and there's a little flat mountain top and actually there's a sort of basin there and people think that this basin and these sort of drains and things that you can see in were actually used for human sacrifices. And you think, of course, that's, I mean, that's to us a very repulsive idea, a very frightening idea. And I remember looking at this and sort of looking around at this amazing sky and all these mountains and, and thinking actually that you could have died in a very ecstatic way as the victim of this human sacrifice because you would be you would be near to God, you know, you climbed all the way up this mountain, you'd be exhausted and, and whatever, and you were sitting in this incredibly, now it's rather a beautiful way to die, I think, is what 
what I'm trying to say. You can take me up there and shoot me when I'm, uh, you know, okay. a few years' time. We might disagree on that one. But let me just um, conclude, unless there's more questions from the audience. Um, and really touching on the point you made, there is no promised land. In some ways, did for Schoenberg really, salvation wasn't in being Jewish or returning to Judaism. Salvation lay in the creation of a Jewish homeland. Well, you know, he was very, that's really hard to puzzle out. Um, you know, the, I, the last words of the third act um, are pretty frightening in a way, because Aaron has just, he said, let him live if he can, and he stands up and Aaron falls down. And Moses then says, and in the desert, you will all learn purity. So, actually, as you pointed out, Moses never gets to the Promised Land. Actually, in his version, the people never got to the Promised Land either. They went into the desert and they, they, they achieved a kind of ascetic purity. And this is a very Schoenberg idea, I have to say. I go for the Promised Land myself every time. But, um, um, so... And you know, he never, he, he didn't like this whole Zionist thing, but that may be complicated by all sorts of things. But, but he never had an alternative idea. He never, in spite of all his fundraising, the, you know, when he was saying, well, I'm gonna pay for all the Jews to be brought out of Germany, he never actually said where they would go. But that's what I'm figuring out, that in a way, because he felt so rejected as a Jew, it was almost a retaliation and I'm going to take them all out with me because they'll all have to feel like that somehow at some point in Europe. So I'm going to take them all out and the creation of a Jewish state will be their only refuge. So again, he's projecting his own angst about being Jewish and the rejection he felt on all of Europe's Jews. Yeah, well, I think, yeah, to a certain extent, that's inevitable, isn't it? I mean, given the fact that he was right, you know, imagine what he was seeing. He saw it. He wrote about it in 1933, you know, the extermination of my race. He, he foresaw it. And, you know, most Jews did not foresee it, even though it's written down in Hitler's book and all of that stuff. They did not foresee it, and we in Britain didn't foresee this, and nobody foresaw it, you know. Very few people were really as candid and as... So, I mean, he was, he was looking into the face of this catastrophe for a long time, actually. And then, you know, living with the knowledge that he'd been right. It's mm -hmm. Okay. Any final comments? But that's what I was asking, that it's not just the image pointing to something else. Even if you say that's true, it's what people are doing around that image that is a problem. Because they projected their permission to do whatever they like on the image. That's the so is Moses' fault? Sim similar people's uh, of desires, uh, you know, just, it is no window to which nothing can No, but, there's no, but what I'm saying is there's nothing wrong with desire and and wanting to do things. What my question was that the excess of what they were doing was a problem. And that's why religion may be boring, may Moses may be a spoil sport. It's about discipline. It's about curtailing desire. Just as I think human freedom today is not about knowing the excess of your freedom. It's about knowing the limits of your freedom and where somebody else's freedom starts. Well, I, I can argue that ultimately it has its own imagery as well. Sure. In ourselves to do good to express ourselves to something else, don't we? Absolutely. And, uh, and I agree with you wholeheartedly that uh, uh, the discipline of thought uh, saves us from the kind of damaging effects of thought. Okay? But the other thing is uh, to come back to the whole business of desire in a relationship to making one's own will known. Um, I'm just reminded of Augustine's phrase Lord, you made us for ourselves. Right. Our hearts are restless yes. until we find our rest in you. Yeah.
They may actually be young rats. No. But the rats look and are they are they rats? Yes. And, and, uh, and most of them are disturbed. And you sometimes see them severe upset. So that is what possibly drives us to transcend our limited self. Absolutely. I agree. And to continue to evolve as a species. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much, everybody. That's thank you, Mona. No, thank and you. you've been a wonderful audience. This has really been a very stimulating and, and, and interesting discussion. And you will have a, a lifetime experience tomorrow night because this, you know, it doesn't come round very often the performance of Moses and Aaron. And, and you know, you will, I think, have a very, very special experience if you're going tomorrow or whenever you go. I hope you're going at some point. Uh, and uh, yes, something to be treasured. And Mona, thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thanks, David. <laughs> 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 <laughs>